I've done this in another place before, and I, 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 I want to do this, um, this section on, on, the, on romanticism. Uh, and I'm going to do that for two reasons. One was a newspaper article that I found uh, the, the first Sunday after we, we got here. And the other one was the comment uh, from a young man in a class that we had last Monday on psychology. That young man is here tonight. And uh, he, he, his, the, the one comment that I wrote down in my notebook when, I, when, the, when he was talking was he said, words have power. And uh, Mr. Nassim in the back. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about romantic, the romantic temperament. And uh, having been a philosophy undergrad I, uh, here, starting 50 years ago this fall, which is pretty scary, <laughs> um, I uh, looked up romantic temperament to see what it is. Uh, see if any of the, you, you see yourself in any of these sensitive Emotional, preferring the exotic to the familiar. In other words, do you, would you rather prefer an unknown restaurant or would you rather go to a franchise diner so you know what you're getting? Another trait, eager for novelty or adventure. So I was thinking, would you rather discover the sights of a town, Duluth, when you're here, or would you rather go on a tour? The romantic would say, let's go. We'll throw caution to the wind. Um, and one other thing, insistence on the uniqueness of the individual to the point of making a virtue of eccentricity is a, is a hallmark of this. Um, I want to single out a, an American this time. Last year I did a French uh, to, to illustrate romanticism with Charles Baudelaire. And we've read some poetry of that, and I talked about that a little bit. This time, I would like to uh, talk about a young man who was from New York, who in 1855 self-published a work entitled Leaves of Grass. We all know that title. His name was Walt Whitman, and for many, his writing can be said to define the spirit of our literary age. Um, curiously, a reviewer of Whitman uh, noted in 1924 that uh, with only one notable exception, Whitman's contemporaries found the book quite impossible to read. But uh, Whitman was at least in the beginning not so uh, universally rejected. I thought I'd hear uh, to be, give a few uh, lines of a sarcastic parody that somebody did on him. This is called The Imitation of Walt Whitman. It was done in the late 19th century. Who am I? I have been reading Walt Whitman and know not whether he be me or me he or otherwise. Oh, blue skies, oh, rugged mountains, oh, mighty rolling Niagara, oh, chaos and everlasting bosh. I am a poet. I swear it. If you do not believe it, you are a dolt, a fool, an idiot. America is a great and glorious land, and the greatest and most glorious product of this great and glorious land is Walt Whitman. This must be so. For he says it himself. Such sarcasm, uh, sarcasm eventually began to dissolve. And by the uh, early 20th century, uh, criticism for Whitman had mellowed so that our same 1924 reviewer said, though we may not, like Whitman, make emotions the center of our religion, we no longer think it necessary to decry a poet who does. More recently, one of the preeminent American scholars of humanities at, at Yale, Professor Harold Bloom, could write 80 years later, Walt Whitman and Leaves of Grass became the crucial celebrant of what I think we yet will call the American religion. And I'm obviously mentioning those two connections 80 years apart because of where I'm going to ask you to follow me here. Uh, Bloom, Professor Bloom continues, uh, one century and a half later after Whitman's book, uh, it still is the most important piece of Whitman wisdom that America has yet contributed. Whitman is the greatest artist that this nation has brought forth. And he just goes on in his praise. Now, so this is pretty uh, forceful endorsements from a major academic writing in our time. And so, for your listening pleasure, 
I have decided to read several lines from Whitman. But don't despair. Now I see heads turning. Don't, don't despair. I'm going to translate this for you. The live bard is going to take this upon himself. So uh, there were nine editions of the book because Whitman kept tuning them up all through his time. And so um, this is the 1892 version of the Leaves of Grass Song of Myself, section one. I celebrate myself and sing myself and what I assume you shall assume. Translation. Hey man, I'm cool just as I am and I'm going to flaunt it. And you should follow my example by tripping out on your own mind or on drugs or sex or rock and roll or video games if you please. I loaf and invite my soul. Translation. I don't have to work to understand life. I just look inward. Still section one. Creeds and schools in abeyance. We don't need no education. We don't need no thought control. We know this? Pink Floyd, 1979, The Wall. Okay? Um, section two. We, you know, shall no longer take things at second or third hand. Translation, you don't have to listen to anyone because you already know all you need to know. Um, I'm going to skip some of these. But this is one of my favorites. Section 24. I dote on myself, and there is a lot of me, and all so luscious. Translation? <laughs> so don't tell me I can't be driving too slowly in the fast lane because I have text messages to send, and I'm special, damn it. <laughs> all right, now setting aside any the humor, I thank you for the, I thank you for the, for the laughs. Uh, I perceive this uh, their unsettling tone in here, that, and I'm going to give you three others that uh, I don't think any, need any comment. Section 7. Has anyone supposed it lucky to be born? I hasten to inform him or her it is just as lucky to die, and I know it. Section 41. The supernatural of no account, myself waiting my time to be one of the Supremes. And he isn't talking about a... Uh, female uh, Motown rock group of the early 60s. And lastly, and this is an interesting one, section 52, I am not a bit tamed. I too am translatable. I sound my barbaric yop over the roofs of the world. Now I read that and then I read another young author who was writing 1997 to 1999 and I'm going to just read a few of those and we'll move on out of Romanticism. The, this section, is, this, these writings are called Thoughts. Know what's weird? Everyone knows everyone. I swear like I'm an outcast and everyone is conspiring against me. Check it out. This isn't good, but I need to write, so here. Within the known limits of time, within the conceived boundaries of space, the average human thinks these are the settings of existence. Yet I, who is more mentally open to anything, see three dimensions. Time, space, and thought. Thought is the most powerful thing that exists. Anything conceivably can be produced. Anything and everything is possible. It strikes me, I was thinking about this, that Dostoevsky wrote in his 19th century novel, Brothers Karamazov, if God is dead, all things are possible. Anyway, um, I think too much. I understand. I am God compared to some of these unexistable, brainless zombies. I understand the everything. I am the God of everything. And then the notation, this is probably my last entry. And apparently it was because the author was Dylan Klebold, who with Eric Harris on April 20th, 1999, rigged three homemade bombs in the cafeteria of Columbine High School, which had they gone off would have killed scores of students, as it was the two of those boys shot 12 students and killed one teacher. Words have power. I see a tie. And I, sorry, I'm what, I got to do this. The, the, the newspaper article um, written by Kathleen Murphy, June 9th, Duluth News Tribune. I'm sitting after Sunday breakfast, cup of coffee, reading a, a puff piece entitled, Four-Legged Family Can Bring Out the Best of Us. Quote, a few weeks ago, we had to put down our cat. 
My husband and I aren't really cat people, but the kids maintained that they were cat people, so of course getting a cat was inevitable. Since I leaned towards excessiveness in all that I do, I went to the Humane Society and adopted none, not one cat, but two. Now what I'm not highlighting is the little poetry she had in there. Um, but the, the, the saccharine story bearing what for me is the most paradoxical of titles continues, but you know this just stopped me dead in my track because what struck with me was the matter of fact way she slipped in this potentially explosive cause into the seemingly benign narrative which said, I lean towards excessiveness in all that I do. Now that's a categorical imperative. I mean, that doesn't, that doesn't say I lean towards excessiveness and excessiveness in being nice to my kids or in donating to my church or in eating dessert. It's just a absolutist statement. And I, I just wonder why you know, we're witness to such travity, travesties that are perpetuated by our fellow human beings who certainly these travesties don't bring out the best in us. Um, and I have one sentence quote from a, a, a French uh, literature professor in 1912, uh, kind of winding out my comments on romantic movement. It said the period, he said, wrote, the period that began in the late 18th century and in the midst of which we are still living, this is 107 years ago, and I would say we're still living in it, has witnessed an almost unparalleled triumph of the sense of the individual over the sense of mankind. Today we would say humankind, but an unparalleled triumph of the sense of the individual over that of the mankind. And I will just conclude by saying authorities still have no motive why on October 1st, 2017, 57 year old Stephen Paddock began shooting from his Las Vegas motel room in a crowd of 22,000 concert growers, killing 57 of them and wounding 40, 422 others in the deadliest mass shooting by a single person in this his, uh, country, history, country's history. Anyway, enough of that. Uh, uh, Winters, um, said in the, this, this English professor that I liked, he said, of the three categories, he says, none is sufficient. There ought to be another one. And I'm here for you, Ivor, because I've started writing 16 years ago doing what I call narrative verse with an attitude. Actually, I, I read this short poem last year, but I'm gonna do it again because I think it is an answer to what I've been saying a minute ago. It's called Soap and the Superego. The superego is that, uh, uh, construct uh, that Freud determined that we uh, develops ideally normally in each of us as we mature and which restrains us from antisocial behavior. And uh, those of you who whose parents lived through the uh, depression will probably identify with this. Soap and the superego. Guilt and hot water flowed over me as I tore the wrapper off the new cake of bath soap. Bemused, I stood motionless in the shower, eager to be cleansed both in flesh and fleeting shame. For many years now, it had always been that way, chagrined not because I opened a fresh bar, but because I discarded the remnant of the old. Yes, my parents had done their jobs well. Reared during World War I and tempered in the Great Depression, both father and mother had their characters forged in the frugality wrought of an era where nothing could be wasted. Accordingly, I too was imbued with parsimony and taught to alloy a soap remnant with a fresh new bar, a nuisance at which I chafed and swore one day to abandon. Now, all grown up, I defy those pangs of conscience and feel a surge of triumph as I resist those demands, ruefully admitting that only through such nurturing, such creation of guilt, can humankind survive. Soap and the superego. Thank you. <laughs>